Well, welcome everyone. I'm Dan Branch and I'm uh, happy to welcome you to this luncheon, special luncheon, and, and introduce our honorary chairs, which are uh, Representative Meyer, Chairman Morgan Meyer, and Keena Meyer. And since uh, our awardee sit, has advised me that the frontal lobe is where you make a decision on voting. Um, we just wanted to remind everyone, as good citizens, that uh, early voting has already started and runs through next Friday, and then the election is March 5th. So um, plug that into the, uh, your cerebellum and uh, make a decision, and make sure you make a decision to get up and go to the polls. And with that, <laughs> and with that I'm going to bring up uh, the first lady of our district here, Kina Meyer. Thank you, Dan. And her sidekick. And my sidekick, yes. Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's Frontiers of Brain Health program, a tale about the frontal lobes as told by a neurologist, featuring Dr. Desposito, the recipient of the 2024 Charles L. Branch Brain Health Award. It's our pleasure to serve as the honorary chairs of today's luncheon, as the Branch family is very special to us <clears throat> and our neighbors down the street. <laughs> How excited and proud we are that Dallas is the pivotal place where the prestigious Dr. Charles Bra Branch Brain Health Award is bestowed. We'd like to welcome our partner from the city of Dallas, Catherine Cuellar. Today's conversation will be especially meaningful because Dr. Charles Branch Jr., son of the award's namesake, will be the one to interview Dr. Esposito. To share more about this year's very deserving award recipient, we'll now turn it over to Dr. Dan Krozik, Brain Health Deputy Director of Research, and Dr. Bart Ritma, Director of the Salmon's Brain Health Imaging Center. All right, thank you for being here. Um, it's a uh, real honor to, to get to say some words at this event. Mark has been an incredibly influential person in, in my life and my career. And um, I, I could talk all day long about all of his academic statistics. They're phenomenal. I'll just say that. Pick any scientist. They're, they're going to have way more gray hair than Mark if, they, if they're even approaching his, his level of scholarly impact. Um, what I want to say is um, some personal career guidance um, features of Mark. Sometimes you have mentors in your life that um, have a way of guiding you with saying just the right thing you needed to hear, and it, it gets you through the moment, and then you find that, that that wisdom stays within your mind and you keep going back to it. So I've been lucky enough to know Mark for almost 25 years, and I'll, t I'll share a few quotes from Mark from different phases of my uh, career development. Uh, anyone that's known Mark or worked with him has a library of Mark quotes that they they uh, rely on, and maybe you don't even know you have this influence, Mark. Uh, I started early in my career. I first met Mark when he'd done, he'd done grand rounds at UCLA. I was a new grad student, and I got to go to dinner with him, and there was a debate about whether little islands of frontal cortex did maintenance or manipulation. Um, and this, a lot of academic ink was spilled on this, and Mark was a really central player in trying to resolve that. And, and at the end of it, he, he, he just kind of summed up by saying, well, however it works out, we're just going to listen to the data, and it's not going to save anyone's life. <laughs> you know, I just thought, like, as a, as a graduate student, it's like, wow, that's, that's someone who has his eye on the ball. It's like, if it doesn't affect a person's life in the clinic, um, it's, you know, let's not worry that much about it. And so as a neurologist, Mark always had this extremely strong goal orientation toward doing those things and that, that kind of science that was really going to have a, 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 an impact on people's lives. So critical. Later in my career, as I was a faculty member, uh, I, after working with Mark for three years directly, um, you know, leadership was changing over and I was a little concerned about what that would mean for my career. And, and Mark just said, you know, it happens all the time. People come and go. Don't worry about it. It's like your golf game. You know, just uh, just play your game. You know, just do your work. <laughs> you know, keep keep shooting it at the flag. And it's just perfect advice. It's like I go back to that all the time. It's like 
whenever something's happened, it's not my control. It's like, I'm just going to play my, I'm just focus on my golf game, you know? <laughs> so from that one, we kind of realized Mark has a sense of, well, for one thing, he's, he's an excellent golfer, you know? Um, but secondly, <laughs> he's laughing. Um, he uh, has that sense of don't get distracted and stay focused on the flag. Um, and then later in my career, I was involved in more diffuse bureaucracy and academic meetings and large scale things that move slowly. And Mark and I were kind of just chatting over lunch and he said, you know, there are people in life that um, want to get the least amount done in the most amount of time possible. <laughs> and that's those people in these meetings. And he said, I've always wanted to get the most done in the least amount of time possible. <laughs> you know? And it was funny, but it was also, it's gotten me through so many long meetings, Mark. I just think of your words like, yeah, these are the people that want to get the least done. And I, you know, I'm just going to get the most done. And so um, out of those three quotes, I just, these have kind of stuck in my mind. Um, so we have this focus on goal directedness. Let's do the best for the patient. You know, as a neurologist, Mark has allowed that to anchor his whole career scientifically. Incredibly impressive um, goal management, goal directedness. Secondly, um, the quote from later about avoiding distractions. It's just like, keep your eye on the ball, keep focused, keep shooting for the flag. And then the third is, is you've got to work with other people. It's a big network of people and you want to subtly guide those people. And those are exactly the features of the frontal cortex. It's all about goals and staying focused and avoiding distraction, but it's also guiding a big network of people. And Mark has mentored so many of us. He's always been a central hub and a, a source of tremendous wisdom. So I feel like Mark is the frontal lobes of the neuroscience community. Uh, the features are uncanny. And um, <laughs> uh, just on a personal note, Mark, thank you for your guiding wisdom in my life and my career. And for all of those uh, people who've been fortunate enough to work with you and be around you, I think every one of us would <laughs> be able to tell a similar story. So uh, it's a tremendous uh, deserving honor that we can give you this award at such a young age. I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Bart Ripma, who also was lucky enough to work with Mark for many years. Yeah, yeah. And what can I say that Dan didn't already say? Is there a line that I can have? <laughs> but, but I will say, yeah, the one thing that really resonates with what Dan uh, was saying was like my parting sort of moments with Mark from, I was moving from Berkeley to my first faculty position at Rutgers. And uh, he, uh, I just said, you know what? what advice would you give me on starting my first faculty position? And his response to me was, he said, I'll, I'll tell you what Judy said to me is, keep your eye on the ball. And so I think that's also, a, Mark is a, is a you know, prolific baseball fan, the Yankees in particular, I, I am a Mets fan. So, <laughs> and Mark always, always, you know, sort of uh, conveys his uh, uh, sort of, um, a sympathy to me for being a suffering Mets fan, while he, <laughs> you know, he's a, a joyous uh, Yankees fan. But uh, what I what I really wanted to emphasize was, you know, all the things that Dan was saying, all the people represented here. We can't even find pictures for everyone, but but Mark has really sort of initiated a an entire generation of neuroscientists that all have benefited from his wisdom. <laughs> and whose work you know, they're carrying on today. You know, and in my work, you know, a lot of the work that I do, you know, I'm drilling down on, deep on the physiology of the, of the fMRI signal, and that's work directly inspired by the work when I got to Area 9 at University of Pennsylvania. And we started working on this together, and it's just been kind of continually, you know, uh, probing the depths of the brain based on the work that, that we started uh, those many years ago. And that I'm sure is true for all of these people. And there's been tremendous productivity that Mark's work has generated 
you know, from the collective uh, efforts of all of these people. And so uh, what I wanted to sort of uh, show was, uh, next slide, uh, is, you know, just, we, we started up trying to count up the so number of scientific papers of all of Mark's collaborators, but we had to sort of, it was such a daunting task, we had to abandon, so I was just saying, so scientific papers number in the thousands that, you know, come from the work of, you know, Mark himself, but also of his, his, uh, his uh, progeny. Uh, Mark himself, uh, that work has been distilled into a number of uh, very influential uh, books and textbooks. Uh, so Mark himself has uh, five books to his credit. Uh, Dan has, has a book. Uh, Brad Postel has a very influential uh, cognitive neuroscience textbook. And of course the latest contribution is from Charan Ranganath, this book that's been getting a lot of publicity. And uh, Mark was even saying that he saw it sort of prominently featured in the airport in a bookstore. And uh, what I heard is he has a great publicity agent and uh, that Taylor Swift is going to be promoting his book on the next tour, on her next tour. And <laughs> so, uh, so just, you know, this, this is among the great things that have happened and, and uh, uh, following from, from Mark's own, or extending out from Mark's own career. So uh, I want to leave you with that. And uh, with that, I'll present a Dan Branch, I think. Is that or who I'm... Oh, Charlie, sorry, sorry, Charlie. Thank you. So, Mark, come on up. Uh, I'm got an extra mic over here, which is good. Let me just put that over there. And then here, there, make yours. Here, have a seat. Now that all of you know what, a, what an amazing person and scientist Mark is, uh, we're going to let him sort of Share, share with us here as part of our sort of um, lunch feast. Um, thank you, Sandy, for a great lunch. It was, uh, it's always tough to kind of eat while somebody else is talking, but that's the plan, right? Uh, so please enjoy your, your meal while we're talking. I'm Charlie Branch. I'm Charles L. Branch, Jr. That's the fancy name, but I'm Charlie to everybody else. But, um, and uh, the Branch Brain Health Award is, uh, recognizes my father, who is also a neurosurgeon, and uh, I'll, I'll share a few thoughts about him a little bit later. But Mark, let's go ahead and get started. And I'll, I'll, uh, I think I gave you some homework questions, and so uh, 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 hopefully these are softballs. Um, how did the Penfield, Rasmussen, Branch uh, sort of work back in Montreal in the 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s really set the stage for further understanding of brain function or brain health? Yeah, so let me, for those of you who don't know Dr. Penfield, um, who trained uh, Dr. Branch and Dr. Rasmussen, um, he, he was the first neurosurgeon uh, in the country that was starting to treat patients with epilepsy with surgery. And this was in the 20s, and then uh, he founded the very famous Montreal Neurological Institute uh, in, in the 30s, where Dr. Branch did his, his training. And at that time, uh, it, it, when he would see, pa when he would operate on patients, he was trying to remove a part of the brain that was damaged in order to relieve their epilepsy. And he did this amazing thing. He would stimulate parts of the brain to try and determine, you know, where was their injured brain and where was their normal brain so that he could not take out a part of the brain that was, was damaged. But in, this, in doing that, he also was trying to do something that no one had ever done, just see what happens to patients when you stimulate a part of their brain because they were awake and conscious. And so he would stimulate and then observe what, you know, and then ask them, what, what did you feel or what did you see or what did you hear? And he was able to do amazing things. He was able to map out the motor, you know, motor cortex and the maps of sensory function. And when he stimulated the temporal lobe, patients would have visual hallucinations or, or, or hear things. And, and this was the first time, really, that we were able to understand sort of how the brain is, is, was, you know, had localized functions. And so that work and the work subsequently with Dr. Rasmus and Dr. Branch really paved the way for us trying to sort of examine the, you know, awake 
living brain and sort of make a connection to figuring out how a brain works. And just to give you a sense of history, it wasn't until the 80s where we, we actually had a, another way to sort of study the living brain with positive trauma emission tomography. And then in the 90s when we had functional MRI. So for me, it was really the foundation for what we do in trying to, today, in trying to understand uh, based how, how the brain works. Uh, and, and given some of the primitive primitive tools at the time they're high tech and yet what we have now it, it's amazing what they did with what they had and so that's that really is a, a tribute to the creativity of, of, of Pinfield and that whole team but um, but we're here to talk about you right um, um, this is this is a, a moment of what, what what is your what would you consider to be your most significant or impactful discovery uh, in your study of the prefrontal lobes or the prefrontal cortex or frontal lobes uh, poor Dan. Dan's an attorney, and he's cerebellum, so we're going to forgive his cerebellar, uh, his cerebellar uh, illusion, but that's okay. Uh, but um, uh, uh, let's, uh, tell us what, uh, what you're most proud of. Sure. Well, Dan, you can use your cerebellum to get to the poles, and then use your frontal lobes to make your... <laughs> so it's okay. We need to use both. Um, yeah, so I, I think, um, obviously, I've been studying the frontal lobes, you know, my whole career, uh, because for me, that's really the, the, the seat of, of the, uh, the essence of what makes us human. Um, I, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with what's my discoveries, because you see up there, it wasn't my discoveries, it was, it's, it's the discoveries of all these wonderful grad students and postdocs that I work with. Um, but. I got started as a neurology resident, um, and I saw my first patient with um, a patient with frontal lobe injury at the Boston VA Hospital um, over 35 years ago, and it was incredibly perplexing because this patient had significant damage to the frontal cortex, to the frontal lobes, could talk, could speak, had a good conversation, you know, having conversations with them, and uh, and they were you know, walking around and just seemed normal, you know, to me as a, as a neurology resident, yet they had this big injury in their frontal lobes. And that, and that was true for, you know, for a lot of neurologists experience that. So I really didn't know what was going on. I was thinking, is the frontal lobes just like the airbag, you know, for the rest of the brain? Well, there wasn't airbags back there, but was it there just to, to protect the rest of the brain? Um, but then as you start to talk to family and friends, they, they tell you, no, he's not, he's not quite, he's not, who he was before. Um, he's, he's someone different. He's not, not Joe. Um, and, and, then when, and then, you know, when you see these patients act, um, Dr. Benson had described a patient uh, from, from our ward where they had a condition called diabetes insipidus where you had to restrict how much water they could drink. And you'd tell them, don't, go, don't drink any water, don't go over to the water fountain. And then you'd see him at the water fountain drinking. And you'd say, what did we tell you? And he'd say, you told me not to drink any water. And we're like, well, why did you do it? He's like, I don't know. And so this was this, this incredible separation of knowledge. They hadn't lost the knowledge of how the world works, um, but they there was a separation of their knowledge and their action. And so, you know, what I think, what I've, we've done over the last 30 plus years is, is try to bring clarity in sort of a mechanistic way as to what, what you know, what underlies these kinds of behaviors. How do we, um, how do the frontal lobes um, act as the CEO of the brain? We really think about it as, as the CEO that's really guiding guiding us and guiding us based on our intentions and our goals and, and what sort of, how do you break that, that down? Um, and so if I'll, I'll take another minute, um, just sort of, I think there's sort of two main things that we've learned. One of the things that the frontal lobes does is it's important for working memory. It holds information in mind. And when you think about it, work, this ability to hold information in mind is, is everything that we do, right? When we're listening to a conversation, we have to hold the beginning of the conversation in or we can't get there, or reading a, a book. If someone asks us to jot down a, a telephone number, well, let's see, we don't, we don't do that anymore. But if someone says, you know, like, you're thinking, like, what's your social security number you're trying to put into form? You're, you're constantly holding information in mind. It's really kind of, our, it's our superpower, right? I know, I know Matt Walker says sleep is our superpower, but during the day, uh, working memory is our superpower. We, it's, it, it, if you measure someone's working memory capacity, how, how, how good their working memory is, it really, it correlates very strongly with, with their reading comprehension, their academic achievements, and a lot of other cognitive abilities. So it's, it's the building block. And the prefrontal cortex is the, the frontal lobes is the part of the brain that where working memory resides. 
um, and and it's interesting. It's you know we've learned that it's it's a it's an interesting system. The brain doesn't have these buffers in the brain. We don't sort of transfer as we're holding into something in mind. We don't transfer it to a specific spot. The prefrontal cortex is able to just hold any type of information online until we we need it. And then the second the second thing that prefrontal cortex does it like I said it's the CEO it, it guides it's something we call uh, top down control where we, it sends these signals to the rest of the brain um, because it connects to every part of the brain it sort of sends signals to the other brain it's able to guide the flow of information across the brain so I'd say you know what we've been able to do is kind of put clarity in, onto what you know on the things we see at the bedside in terms of you know mechanisms of of how the brain actually does it. Which is really important for those of you that have automobiles and something sounds funny in your car until somebody can actually plug in something and say, oh, it's here, you really don't know what to fix or how to fix it. And so from a brain perspective, understanding what the frontal lobes are doing and how they're doing it is actually key to our understanding of just how to fix brain problems or, 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 or manage behavior. So. There's a lot of research going on now, and, and, and um, we're trying to understand both the command and control and the retention functions uh, of the frontal lobe. So which of these is, which is most promising? What are you, you going to put your bet on, bet your money on? Which, which, uh, which one's most exciting to you? Yeah, well, I think to go further into how this all works is, is it, um, you know, the frontal cortex, uh, the frontal lobes both stores and um, controls. And so it, what, what it stores is rules and goals. Um, it, it all, all the rules that we learn in life and, and the goals that we, are, 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 that, we, um, that we have are represented in the, in the frontal cortex. And we, we use those goals and rules to guide us in behavior. And we, we, it allows us to sort of behave Appropriately, um, you know that when you're in your doctor's office, for example, and the phone rings, you don't pick up their phone, right? That's a rule that's being scored, and your frontal cortex knows, knows not to apply it. Um, you know, I know Dan and Bart want to pull up a chair right now and hang out with us and have this conversation, but they're not going to do that because that's uh, inappropriate for this for this context. But it might be appropriate in another context. So, how we navigate the world through through learned rules and uh, goals is all stored and. What's exciting to me is we're starting to actually learn how that actually works. The brain, the frontal lobes actually stores all of these rules and goals in a, in, from very concrete to very abstract. So it has this way of sort of, there's some, goal, some sort of goals that are very concrete, like, you know, I, I'm thirsty, I want to get a glass of water, and then there's some goals that are very abstract, like getting tenure for a, a, you know, a goal, getting tenure for a young faculty member. So we have, rep we represent all, and the rules are that way too. Some rules are very concrete and some rules are very complicated. So another way of thinking about it, and I'll, I'll use my golf analogy on, on this one, uh, is that just think about someone who is hit a ball into the bushes uh, and which I, I know he said I'm a good golfer, but I'm not. So I'm usually in the bush. And so I can't see, you know, I can't, see, my goal is to get it to the flag, as he said, right? I, my, I can't see the flag, right? So I have to hold in mind sort of that sort of, I have to hold in mind where that flag is. And, and my goal is very simple, just get it out of the bush, right? But then another goal might be, um, well, uh, you know, I could, I could kick this ball out if no one sees me, and then, but I know the rules. I know that it's a two-stroke penalty, so that's a little bit more abstract. And then finally, the most abstract thing in my head is like, this is just supposed to make me healthy. It's supposed to lower my cholesterol, make my blood pressure better. So I'm holding all of this information, right? I'm holding all these rules, and, but I'm holding them in a hierarchical way. What I mean by hierarchy, I'm holding them from abstract to concrete. And our brain is able to do that, and, and it turns out that really complex systems, uh, you know, are, they, they work more efficiently when we do it that way. We can't hold everything in mind, but we can organ if we organize it in a way, we can more efficiently sort of, you know, guide our, our actions, probably like hitting a golf ball. So um, how do we fix broken stuff? I mean, there, in your recent publications, you've identified several interventions or therapies that would address or improve frontal lobe dysfunction or, or the disease or injury or whatever. What are some of those? Could, could you share some of those uh, with the audience? Yeah, so let, let me first say that, um, you know, all of us uh, have less than optimal 
frontal lobe function at different points of the day or week or, or, or year. So anything that is going to help sort of patients with frontal lobe deficits can help us all, right? We, we know that um, poor sleep, uh, poor nutrition, um, stress, multitasking, these all take a hit. You know, the frontal lobes take a hit from all of these things. So, so the simple things of just better sleep and don't multitask, which I, I learned in my brain game text challenge, uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and, you know, and reducing stress, this is all going to improve frontal lobe function. That, that's one side of it. The, the other side of it is trying to develop uh, interventions that are really um, to get at these mechanisms. How do we boost working memory and how do we boost sort of top strategic top-down control and how do we boost how goals are represented. And, and that's, and I, they come in, there's sort of two forms. I, I think there's, there's one where, where what I'd call cognitive therapy, uh, and then there's the other would be pharmacological. Um, the cognitive therapies you have right here, this, the SMART training that's been developed by, by Sandy Chapman and colleagues is one of those therapies. Um, goal management training, which was developed by Ian Robertson, is another one of those therapies. These are therapies that are not just based on our intuition of how the brain works, they're based on these are the mechanisms of, of how the frontal lobes function, and we're going to design uh, interventions that are that target those, try and boost those those neural mechanisms. So it's not meant to um, remediate, like you know, like a, a memory. You know, just you're having problems with memory, we'll, we'll write it down, write down a list. It's really trying to change, uh, change the and improve these mechanisms, and some of those are you know, therapist driven and, you know, where it does take hard work uh, and some of them hopefully will be uh, gamified where we can, or there are more immersive ways of, of doing it on your own. It, there, there's the sky's the limit and how we develop it. And then the second line I think for about improving frontal lobe function is it turns out that there's different brain chemicals um, in the brain, dopamine, serotonin, um, norepinephrine and the neurochemical dopamine happens to be the one that, that is most abundant in the frontal, in the frontal lobes. And so we have more, the, the frontal lobes depends on dopamine. And so when you boost dopamine in the brain, um, you boost working memory function, you boost uh, frontal lobe function. So especially for our patients, uh, like we know for instance Parkinson's disease patients, when they're low, when they're off of their medications, they have much worse frontal lobe function than when they're on. But even patients with traumatic brain injury have, can benefit from a boosting of dopamine. But uh, so, so those, who, those are kind of the two approaches I'd say that are the most, um, the ways to sort of really get at the frontal lobes. We, uh, you know, with our, our novel technologies, especially neurostimulation, um, we've had made great progress with Parkinson's disease, at least in the mo motor control function. Um, we also know that you can actually stimulate areas or cells in the brain or circuits and change these uh, chemical fluxes that are actually controlling. Um, I think you've said in one of your papers that you know not enough dopamine is bad, too much dopamine may be just as bad, and so it's, it's finding that sweet spot. Uh, are there some technologies, uh, neurostimulation, uh, magnetic ultras focused ultrasound, what, what are some of the kind of new tech stuff that you think might actually help us? Yeah, so I think transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is basically um, applying a magnetic pulse uh, to the brain, which stimulates uh, electrical activity, is going to be a prominent tool for, for improving frontal lobe function. Right now, uh, it's approved for major depression, and it's, it's, it's becoming a, really a mainstay of treatment for patients with depression. It can be as effective as medications. Um, so TMS is being used widely for depression, and at UCSF, uh, they've been using it for uh, chronic pain and finding that patients with chronic pain from diabetic neuropathy or other uh, injuries can be just as um, can be helped just as much. And the same thing with frontal lobe injuries. Um, it, it's a matter of. Uh, you know, the problem is just not more or less, you know, that there's less activity in one area or just one area's damage. It's, it's, it's a disruption of a network, brain networks. And what TMS can do is restore that kind of pattern of network activity. And so that's going to be a very important uh, t tool for, for frontal lobe uh, rehabilitation as well. It, it's amazing. I mean, even at Wake Forest, we're looking at um, deep brain stimulation as a potential treatment for um, or prevention for um, uh, cognitive impairment. 
and, and you know, because we know it's, yes, you have cellular dropout that can affect that, but it's actually the connectivity and the fluxes that are going on that maybe is, and, and, and managing that. Well, you know, uh, you, you alluded to uh, some things that are going on here at the Center for Brain Health um, um, that may actually improve frontal lobe command and control function, retention function. How about, uh, how about helping our circuits work better? Is anything in specific here that you're aware of that is really gonna, is, is, the, is the exercise programs, is that helping the, connections or is that helping the cells themselves? What do you think? Yeah, I think all of these interventions are helping networks. I, I think it's, um, we, we've, that's sort of an exciting thing about neuroscience in the last 10 years is we've moved from thinking about areas as, as being, having one function and being very, and cognitive functions being very localized to being very distributed across networks. And so there's a real boon in, in network, what we call network neuroscience. And so we, we, we've done a lot of work sort of just showing that if you, you can measure someone's network with tools like functional MRI. So you can put someone in the scanner and you can have them scan for five or 10 minutes and, and then you can establish their network. And we all have very different networks as you can imagine. And the way networks are organized, they're organized in a way in which they're organized into modules. And they're very much like an airline network or, or electrical grid network where it's, it's the same. Uh, there are these hubs uh, in these networks and some hubs are more important than other, uh, others, right? In an airline network, DFW and Chicago are much more important than Austin and Milwaukee, for example, right? In terms of the overall flow. And so what we've learned is that uh, it's it targeting these hubs and, and, and really Figuring out how your brain is organized and how your hubs are organized can tell us a lot about sort of if therapy is going to be helpful and, and if therapy is working or not. So I think that's where the future is, is measuring brain health. One measurement of brain health will be sort of measuring uh, these, brain, these brain networks. How, 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 how much duplication or replication of function do we have in different areas of the brain? Is that something you've been able to really get a handle on? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think when we talk about brain plasticity, I don't really think about it as, as growing new cells. The brain is capable of growing new brain cells, and there's some parts of the brain that are very active, like the hippocampus, and that is w w the way it's plastic, is growing uh, new brain cells. But I think the real engine of brain plasticity is networks reconfiguring, that, that we have this redundancy that, okay, we've, we've damaged this one network, but now we've got other networks that can take over for function. And it's, it's, it's shifting, it's, it's our ability to serve these therapies um, to shift into, into these other networks to, to take over function is I think where, where the recovery is, is taking place or how the recovery is taking place. And it may be that the, because we don't tell our networks to heal themselves, they figure out how to heal themselves, but is it the frontal lobe that's actually driving this healing or this reconfiguration? And how are we going to figure that out? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think the frontal lobes is a very important hub. I don't know if it's Chicago or DFW, but it's one, it's one of them. And, I, you know, if you're trying to get from New York to San Francisco and something's going wrong in Chicago, you ain't getting there. So it's, it's, uh, so it's, it's, it's these are really important. Uh, and what's really exciting is, is that we can measure it. We can, for everyone in this room, I can measure your, how modular your brain is and you'll all be slightly different. And how modular you are will predict, like I said, how you will benefit or not benefit and also but give us a target for how to how to get your modularity up you know for, to, to improve your, your networks get your questions ready uh, because we're going to actually ask you all to sort of uh, ask the experts some questions here in just a second but um, to tee that up or to actually conclude m my component was I'm going to ask you to get out your crystal ball okay and and um, there's some serious societal challenges that I believe are arguably associated with or secondary to frontal lobe dysfunction, um, connectivity problems. Can you envision uh, a, a pathway to early or preemptive identification of these dysfunctions in people with available or even uh, developing resources so that we can actually make our world safer by figuring out who's broken and helping them get fixed before they do something bad. Yeah, well, I, you know, I'd say that really it's going to, we talked about this the last couple of 
days that for me the first step is going to be a measure to measure what brain health is to get a definition of what brain health is before we you know in order for us to know if, if you're not healthy or, or um, and so a lot of the work I think is, is what's being done here for example is, is the development of the brain health index is, is you first we need to assess like what 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 are we trying to achieve we're trying to be optimal right we're not trying to be superhumans we're trying to optimize our frontal lobes and optimize our health but we have to we need to know what optimal is and so I think the development of the brain health index here for example is is exactly that's the goal is to sort of develop a, a marker um, that can tell us with uh, that all these interventions are either working or not working and where we're supposed to go um, that the brain health index you know also takes into account all the things that affect you know f cognitive function like emotion and social social interactions and well-being is important too we can't leave out all of those things um, and along with and then the biomarkers that we've talked about so I think if we have a biomarker whether it's a network biomarker or some other, and we have a, a behavioral biomarker like the brain health index, then we, uh, then we have the gold standard of what we're trying to achieve. And then it becomes uh, an easier question to know like where, where someone should be or, or not be. I mean, the tough question, I, I know Sandy would like us to talk about it being reaching optimum and not always couch it as dysfunction because, um, because I think we all have you know, we all are less than optimal uh, in, in function, but when it's, it's, you know, as neurologists and our surgeons, when it becomes, when it becomes two, three standard deviations from there, and then, then we, we feel this is, this is clearly not just less than optimal, it's dysfunction. But wherever we are on the curve, um, I do think that if we have this, this marker, these markers, then we know where to, then we know where to go. So then once we have that, we, we need to have these, all these therapies, I think in my opinion, have to be just embedded in what we, we do, right? They have to be embedded in our education, they have to be embedded uh, in the workplace, they have to be embedded in our life, not in a way that like we're sending you off to executive, you know, frontal lobe camp <laughs> to make your frontal lobes good, but it's just part of the, the culture so that we can, uh, that we can, we can boost these important abilities without it seeming, you know, seeming that it's anything uh, unusual. I, I'd hate to see that we, that we have, you know, we have, oh, I'm going to spend 30 minutes on brain health today, you know, and, and 45 minutes tomorrow. I just think all day is, is where we should be spending on, on improving brain health. And then we can, we can do more or less depending on where you are, you know, where you are relative to where we think you should be. Yeah. And it's, uh, you got to start somewhere. And so again, thank you and thank Sandy and thank a lot of folks, Dan, others who've, who've really sort of committed to sort of getting us to the Starting gate, <laughs> I said to say that, but, but uh, is, is, if the future is really as rich as we think it is, we really are at, at the starting gate. And uh, uh, Penfield and Rasmussen and Branch's work earlier was the kind of the, the it was the, the, the preparatory work, right? And, and so now we're kind of really getting to the, okay, how's it gonna go from here? So questions from the audience. I know we've got a couple of microphones roving, but if you have a question, here's, here's one. Good. We've got a couple of questions, and we have a group online as well. I know Paige, you'll be uh, sort of let us know if you've got a, a, a question from our virtual audience. Mark, congratulations again. Uh, you could, you've collaborated with Sandy and the Center for Brain Health for as long as I can remember. Uh, what's the guy in Berkeley doing collaborating with the place in Dallas? I'd love to know what inspired what, what, why you collaborate with Sandy. What inspires you to do that? Yeah. So um, this is being recorded. <laughs> um, you know, Berkeley is a wonderful place, uh, and um, but but the the goals there are really about you know advancing knowledge for knowledge's sake and and making discoveries that that um, you, you know that advance knowledge in my opinion, but don't necessarily translate to the real world. And so it was a bit frustrating to me. Um, I came from University of Pennsylvania Medical School where. It, the culture was very different. Everything we do is trying to help people. But I went to Berkeley to try and uh, build a brain imaging center and, and build up a computer science department there. So um, yeah, I, I think very early on, as you heard from one of the quotes of Dan, it was it's just frustrating to me that all of this knowledge was not getting out, getting out of the university and into the real world. And that's when I discovered uh, Sandy's program. And it was just, I, it, it, we can't, 
Is this being recorded? We can't do this at Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> we just don't have the infrastructure. And universities, you know, universities, arts and science universities, unfortunately, don't have this kind of infrastructure. Uh, it's, it's, it requires thinking out of the box and being flexible and, and breaking down traditional silos. And, and we do a great job at discovering a lot of great things. Um, but, but um, yeah, so my goal has been always just try to get it, get it out of the lab and into, into, the, into the real, real world. Here. Yes. Um, does the current gun violence have anything to do with the prefrontal lobe functioning? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, of course, I think we, when we think about, you know, where faulty decision making comes from, it's, it's the frontal cortex. When we see patients with um, damage, especially to the orbital frontal cortex, they make faulty decisions. and, and, and um, and so that this, the, any, any impaired decision making is going to come. So hopefully with boosting frontal lobe function, we impair um, decision making. What's interesting, like I said, about these patients, even some of my patients, they end up doing very, so they, they get themselves into trouble, criminal trouble, and they do things like, you know, write bad checks and commit crimes, and, but they're always aware that they always know that, that, that it's wrong. Um, it, it, there's something really, there's a separation from their knowledge of what's wrong and then what they, they do. And so that sort of gives me hope that it's, it's just a disconnection between knowing and, and doing and that we can, we can work on that. If you've lost social rules, that's a harder thing for me to think conceptually I haven't replaced it, but, but I feel like we can, if we can build up that connection, uh, we can lead to interventions that lead to better decision making. Can Quick question. We've got uh, several questions. Okay, so I don't. Who's first? Are we going to do? Doing got one so over here. We we have a virtual question. Okay, go ahead. Um. So this question is: Can networks be reconfigured for dementia patients with frontal temporal dementia? Networks can be reconfigured for anyone. Um, yeah, I think there's the brain has the capacity to reconfigure networks, and there's not any disease, neurological disease. I know that's not doesn't have the potential. Uh, to reconfigure networks. And, and just to take it a step back, we, we, reconfig we reconfigure our own networks all the time uh, when we're just in normal behavior. When we're multitasking, we are really reconfiguring networks. <laughs> and we're not. <laughs> when we're reading a nice novel, uh, we're, we're in a different network state. So we're constantly in different network states. Just, just that's how the brain works. And so our goal is, you know, in, in developing interventions, how can we reconfigure networks that have been damage and it's entirely possible. Spoke about the change in brain science when you were able to do MRIs or fMRIs. As a layman, I just have a question. For instance, if you had ADHD or something, would a normal MRI, I mean would an MRI look normal, but if you did an fMRI, would you see something different? Just Kind of yeah. Like so, people. so that's the exciting thing about fMRI, which is looking at the activity of the brain, as to regular MRI, which is just the structure of the brain. When when you look at a, the just the structure of the brain, major major neurological disorders like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, you can't. It looks normal the brain, and even in ADHD, uh, it just looks normal the structure. But when you look at the networks, it's very it's clearly different than than normal. So. Yeah. The fMRI can, yeah. The, the problem with it is that uh, it, it's hard to do it in any one individual. If you two, take a group of, of individuals who have ADHD, they will look different than a group of healthy individuals. But it's very hard to, in any one person to say, you know, to say this is abnormal because of how much individual differences there are in the world. But, but, the, that's the, but there are, that's what I mean by a biomarker, that we derive these uh, measurements that can actually identify a, a difference in you as opposed to just you as a, as a, as a group. But I, I could just add to that, but I don't think fMRI is going to be the tool that's going to scale up to the, it's not the tool that your primary care physician is going to use to help them. We're, we're, what we're working on here is trying to use fMRI to guide us to, to develop biomarkers that could be used at home or in the family doctor's office. Or on the iPad, or on your iPhone, or yeah. with an app. I mean, everybody's got an app. At some point, the, 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 I hate to say it, the gold standard is an, an app that you can actually say, oh my goodness, I got bad, bad frontal lobe day. I need to sort of <laughs> do something. Uh, so uh, you're laughing, but... I agree uh, with that. <laughs> uh, um, go ahead, who's next? 
I was just going to ask a question about how are we doing from your perspective on attracting youth into uh, coming out, helping grow these new solutions? Next, Mark Esposito. Yeah, well, <laughs> um, I think, you know, it, my, my daughter's in, in, in education and studying education. It's, it's been amazing to me how education has picked up on the idea that executive function and cognitive control and frontal lobe function is, is something we should be paying attention to in, what we're, in how we organize curriculums. So there's a number of educational technology companies all, uh, all over the country partnering with schools of education and partnering with cognitive scientists to try and bring this into the curriculum. I mean, I, I know that I would have loved to have had goal management training in high school, college, and medical school. Uh, it, you know, this, this is something that just needs to be embedded into the culture. We, we know it works, but it's not how we traditional te you know, traditionally teach our, our students. So, so it's make, obviously Sandy and the Center of Health, Brain Health knows this and is doing exactly, doing exactly that. Question over here. over this side of the room. Okay. Along the same line that the lady was talking about, why so much shooting? You know, a lot of times you hear the parents will say, he's a normal kid. So are there any tools that the parents should use to detect something may happen, there's something wrong with this young man or young woman? Well, again, I, I, you know, it's, it's just a matter of what we mean as normal, of course, um, but, but I think that we, we it's, it's hard you know, it's hard. It's it's the same reason why when you go to your primary care doctor, uh, they, they don't really know if you have mild cognitive deficits or not. You know, they they don't really know if you're in the early stages of dementia because they're just having a conversation with you and not really doing anything to really assess, you know, these higher level abilities. So I think it's just a matter of um, it have you know, we need to sort of bet. We, we can assess this better. We just don't do that. We just don't have these tools for our teachers or, or for parents to sort of pick up on something that may suggest that their, their brain health is not optimal. And then the other challenge is once you picked it up, you go to your primary care doctor or your teacher and say, here's the, somebody's the problem. What's the treat? What's the therapy? What do you do next? And if we don't have a really good as physicians, if we don't have a, here's what you ought to do to fix it, then knowing what's wrong may not really be as good as we thought. But so we've got who, um, who, we're going to go around the room here. The hands are going up faster than we can answer the question. So, Paige, we have, a question right here. Um, you have come a long way in our understanding of the brain and the frontal lobes, and you've been such a pioneer in that. What I'd love to hear about a time that you had a hypothesis that was just you know proved wrong, or like w things that were just surprising to you in your career. Just in the frontal lobe research in, in general, yeah. I mean, I mean the big when I got started in this business, um, there were psychologists studying, you know, the frontal lobes and working memory, and then there was uh, nurse neurophysiologists studying, and they they weren't talking to each other, and uh, so it surprised me that things haven't been, you know, haven't lined up, you know, between the two disciplines. I mean, a very prominent theory of working memory, like I alluded to earlier, that there's these buffers in the brain. You know, you got this buffer that holds on to verbal information, and you got this other buffer. It's like a computer. You sort of send it off to this buffer, and it holds it there, and, and uh, you know, and that, that's how we were expecting the brain to work, but, but actually the brain doesn't work. It's, it's amazing, the, the, brain, the whole brain is a, a buffer. Wherever the information is, the frontal lobes are able to just kind of keep, keep it there, and it's a much more efficient. And I guess what's also surprised me is that uh, the brain ends up being very similar to, well, it shouldn't have been surprising, but I guess in retrospect, that is very similar to almost every network that we can think of. I mentioned airline networks. It, and, and electrical grids and, and social networks. I, I guess it's because uh, maybe those networks were designed in that way because we had some intuition of how the brain brain does it. But um, it's been surprising to me how much we can learn from other systems that are not the brain uh, in, in terms of uh, you know how, how the brain is organized. Doctor, we besides the the, sh the shootings, we hear as a society. CTM or athletes in going into concussion protocols or PTSD. As a society, are are we becoming more aware of of frontal lobe or brain injury problems? And if so, is it is it helpful? Is it is it helpful for all of us to to say this to to one day be able to say, oh, today I 
mm, with my iPad, this may be a bad, may be a bad frontal lobe day because I, I, I fell off the ladder yesterday or, or did something. Is, that, is it helpful in, in, in your work? And are you seeing this, this awareness as a society uh, benefiting this research or what we're going to do in the future? Yeah, I mean, I, I think of all the neurological disorders that I treat, the concussion is the one that most worries me um, and, and most frustrates me. And I'm talking about mild concussion. I'm, I'm talking about patients who uh, hit their head and didn't even lose consciousness and just felt off for a minute or two. Uh, and, and, then, and then were dizzy and had sensitive to light and, and feeling off and mentally foggy. And, you know, and their doctor said, oh, it's going to get better or better go back and play, you know, <laughs> go back on the field or whatever. And, and, uh, and then a week goes by, and then another month goes by, and then they say, well, oh, everyone recovers, you know, within a couple months, so just keep waiting it out. It turns out that probably more, there, there's a huge number of patients a year out of a minor concussion that are still not feeling right. And uh, we're, we're ignoring that, that group because we have this sense that, you know, it's not, you know, it's not, um, you know, it's, there's, there's nothing you can do for it anyway, and, and um, it's not really a, a big deal. But it is a big deal, right? If any of us lost any sort of, you know, 10% of our cognitive, our frontal lobe function, we'd have a hard time doing what, what we're doing. And so what's frustrating to me is that we can help these, we can help these individuals if it's, is, if it's recognized. And so yes, when you have a concussion, for example, the frontal lobes is the area of the brain that takes the biggest uh, hit. That's, that's the part of the brain that, that gets the damage, and that's what we need to, to focus on. So earlier you were talking about the multitasking to you know, mode of the brain and then the not reading mode of the brain. Um, coming from the business world, I'm, I'm picturing the days when I have a lot of meetings back to back I'm in that mental uh, multitasking mode. But then on project days, I have to focus, I have to get into the, the granularity of things. Have you had any luck or done any research to intentionally code switching between multitasking and or uh, deep dive focused brain states? Is there any science on how to control that and find yourself in one state that you don't want to? Yeah, so if I, you know, like I said, your brain is made up of all these modules, and um, these modules each have distinct sort of functions, and they all talk to each other, um, but they're separate, and they're independent, and, and uh, when you do something complex, they, they work together. Um, and so what, what's been discovered is that um, those individuals who have brains that are more modular actually do better at most tasks because they're able to sort of take their modules and then reconfigure them in many different ways to get the, the job done. And those brains that are less modular, um, that don't, don't, you know, are not as flexible uh, in sort of getting the networks where they could be. So we, we kind of know sort of how the system works, that we can move, that we need to move from one brain state to another brain state in order to achieve a goal. And, um, but the good news is that you can, you can make someone more modular. Um, goal management training in a, in, a, in a group of traumatic brain injury patients that we studied, we made their brains more modular at the end of, at the, end of the, the training. Um, and they were, and, and we made, and they improved, you know, and they improved. So, so this is a flexible system. So with, with multitasking, you would think you'd have all these modules and sure that the brain's built for multitasking because each module can do its thing. No, it actually turns out that the modules have to work together, you know, and so when you start to pile on different tasks, the brain can't handle uh, multiple tasks. It's better to just stop and uh, do one, one task at a time. Now that's very different than holding different goals in mind. You know, I, I, I want you to sort of hold in mind your long-term goals and your short-term goals and your medium-term goals. That, that's not multitasking. That, the brain's really good at that. Like I said, it can hold all these different goals, but it, it can't sort of do two things at once. It can, but not well. <laughs> Okay. I was going to say, we've got a question from our virtual audience, and it is, despite all the promising new technologies, what are some of the major challenges that researchers face in frontal lobe research? Um, boy. So, I, you know, I, I am, mo yeah, I'm not worried that we're not going to have the technology to, to, to help us. It just seems, yeah, it's unbelievable to me how fast technology is moving. So I have, I, 
I, I just think we'll be able to build anything we need to build. Uh, it's just, my worry is just how we're going to apply it and how we're going to navigate through all these these technologies. Um, I, I did we bring this up? I don't know if we brought it up at lunch or dinner or in the meeting, but we were talking about like w when there is a hundred different technologies to help your frontal lobe function, which one are you supposed to use and who are you supposed to ask? Your, your doctor, your, your teacher, your who, who, you know, who are you supposed to talk to? So I'm, I'm worried of how we're going to vet all of this technology. And so that's why I think we need places like the Center of Brain Health that can vet, that, that, that can be evidence-based and, and can sort of be an advocate and a voice for the public on, on what science is bringing to the, to the table. Because there's no regulation, right, to, to technology or to apps or anything. So, we one yeah. More, we got one more question up here that we're going to need to move on. So okay. Yes. Uh, I'm participating in a three-year study from Southwestern, um, the relationship between blood pressure and short-term memory. Are you aware of that study? Can you elaborate on what that's about? <laughs> yeah, well, know your competition, and I, I mean, what I wanted. I mean, what. What this all, you know, there are a number of studies that are just uh, studying the relationship between vascular brain health and neural brain health, and that's an important point to make. Um, uh, as cognitive scientists, we only think of the brain in terms of brain cells, and we don't, we forget that it's supplied by a blood supply, just like the heart. And so your brain is not going to do well if it's not getting good blood flow. Um, no matter how good your neurons are, it, it needs good blood flow. And uh, so we, here, especially, we found that, that the vascular health is just as critical in, in sort of uh, in terms of how our therapies, how their therapies work. And so that, that study and others is how a mod modification of um, blood pressure and other vascular factors can improve cognitive function, which it absolutely can. So there's been a number of studies showing that aerobic exercise can improve frontal lobe function just as well as cognitive therapy can. And so I don't want to leave out that, that there, there are multiple, we're going to throw everything about the kitchen sink at it, right? There are multiple ways we're going to try to boost the brain, uh, both on the neural side and on the, on the vascular side. Mark, thank you so much for, for an amazing, amazing conversation. You, uh, you really get to, to really feel like you're in the, in the, in the presence of, of, of greatness and uh, what, a, what an amazing body of work and, and, and legacy that you've created. Uh, I, I, I'll let you sit down for a second because I know they're going to call you back up here in a moment. Um, uh, take a, you can get a, get a, get a, a drink. But um, uh, for those of you that don't, don't, mean, don't know me, I'm, I'm, again, I'm Charlie, Charles Branch Jr. And, and um, I'm, I've been a neurosurgeon for... 40 some odd years now. I just actually retired at the end of December, which is great. Yay, you know. Um, I've been at Wake Forest University out in North Carolina and uh, basically did my medical school here in South, at Southwestern over at, uh, uh, back when, before all the good stuff happened, I guess. No, no, we, we were in Parkland, was still Parkland. Uh, and, but but uh, I pursued neurosurgery as a profession because my dad was passionate about being a neurosurgeon. Uh, I thought he worked too hard. I thought it was a way too long a educational pathway to get there. But um, he was, he was, he didn't talk me into it. He showed me how wonderful that profession is. And uh, then you sort of get like a magnetic force. It's irresistible. And um, uh, but 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 dad was dad was passionate about helping people, and one of the the great um, sort of uh, let's say things about his life in Montreal when when uh, when he was there with Penfield and Rasmussen was uh, then and even now to some degree epilepsy your seizures is a is an, a, a crippling disease for anybody that's got a family member someone who has one seizure. It disrupts your life. If you have multiple seizures, it's devastating. Whether it's for school or work or driving, whatever, and and uh, the ability to actually sort of uh, figure out 
someone who is crippled from epilepsy and change their life by figuring out what part of the brain didn't work and taking that part out and then getting them back up and running. And I, we heard story after story as kids about uh, these, um, how, 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 how great it was to, to that so-and-so got their life back. And so uh, it's, 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 um, it's a legacy that I get to enjoy as, a, as, a, as an offspring and Dan and Al and all of our kids and grandkids and spouses. and. Um, and yet, um, um, we're just absolutely honored and, and privileged to, that, that the Center for Brain Health has now taken that, um, his passion and his desire to make people with brain problems better and turn it into an award and recognize some amazing neuroscientists over these uh, decade now uh, for that. So, um, in that light, I'd like to ask Sandy Chapman, who's the founder and director of the, of, the, of the Center for Brain Health here. I think all of you know her. And then Francesca uh, uh, Philby, who's actually the director of the Cognitive Neuroscience Lab and the Center for Addictive Disorders, to come up and uh, bestow the uh, uh, branch, Charles L. Branch Brain Health Award on this year's recipient, Mark Despacito. Sandy? Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Mark. Um, the Charles Branch Brain Health Award has been uh, had started about uh, 13 years ago um, when I first joined the Center for Brain Health. And um, it's co-hosted by the Center for Brain Health at UT Dallas, as well as the University of California at Berkeley. And uh, Mark was really the uh, spearhead for that. And so we've really enjoyed um, uh, uh, showcasing the brain health discoveries and also bestowing upon this award to uh, brilliant scientists, contributors to brain health like um, Dr. Mark Desposito. Um, and so, um, befitting to the anniversary of the Center for Brain Health, 25th year anniversary, a very short amount of time for the amount of discoveries and contributions that it's made. Um, is also the fact that we're bestowing the Charles Branch Brain Health Award to the youngest recipient ever. So congratulations, Mark. I love it. Last year when we mentioned it to Mark, he's like, oh no, he's so humble. I know Dr. Branch would be smiling down on today because when you think about a person who's so smart, has changed the world, and has a heart of humanitarian like your father, he would be so happy for us to bestow this award to Mark Desposito. I've been working with Mark for almost 20 years, we figured out, and I, this is the first time we've gotten his wife here, Judy. Uh, and I'm trying to scare her a little bit that, <laughs> And Mark said, Sandy, I'll never say yes to you to come to Dallas, but I'll never say no. <laughs> because he sees the work here is so leading edge. But his discoveries, I mean, just to see, no one has inspired that many people. He has more publications. He, we brought him in very early on, and he said, this is something that's going to change humanity, the Brain Health Project. He said, I became a neurologist to really do this. You know, I take care of a lot of sick brains, but why don't we do what the cardiologists do and take care of good brains to make them stronger? And so he's the person I call, you know, Ghostbusters? He's my Ghostbuster. <laughs> Mark Desposito, we are so honored uh, by that. I want you to come up, but I also, before we do it, but don't you know your dad is truly, truly smiling on today with this incredible, the heart that he had, the spirit that he had. When we got to meet with him and Mark got to meet with him, how meaningful it was. Um, and we're so honored to have Kena and Representative Morgan Meyer, such leaders. They've made such a difference in our state. Uh, they've transformed us. They've supported us. We're just so, so grateful. And when I mentioned this, they wanted to be here to make grand things happen. So thank you for being our co-chairs. So Mark, come on up. We have this beautiful award. So we give gorgeous awards because we don't want it to be put in your closet. 
Francesca, with, this is a neuron that, and he doesn't have to carry it on the airplane. Judy does. Judy does. <laughs> Not really. We're going to mail it, mail it to him, but he will have this mailed to him with the neuron that was specially designed so that he'll forever remember the Dr. Charles Branch Brain Health Award this year. Mark, we're so happy to have you with this. <laughs> So, how are your frontal lobes doing? We hope great because tomorrow we're going to have family brain day. Come 10 o'clock, bring your kids. 10 till 2, I think. 10 till 2, here's the QR code. You do not want to miss this. Please join, sign up, bring your kids. And we have a brain building exhibition upstairs at HKS. Some of the questions you ask about how to use your brain. We've got an exhibit with HKS, who's one of our partners. This last, this whole week, celebrating 25 years, is just beginning. Mark has promised to work with us for the next 20. Right, Mark? <laughs> and each of you. Let's make our future for brain health better. Thank each of you for being here. Join us, Debbie. Please tell about who designed the award. Okay. So, when we designed this building, we didn't want it just to be an ordinary building. We wanted it to be something that people came and inspired. So we wanted a neuron chandelier that could move the neural impulses, the modularity. You can even see it, right? It's, it is, and this whole building was designed like the brain's frontal lobes because we know how important that is for your life. David Gappa is one of the most gifted intellects, architects, and glass blowers. And we asked him, during this, would you design a special award for the Charles Branch Brain Health Award? So thank you for reminding how special this is. I know, and sometimes we are able to get the neuron. It's a special gift for our 25th anniversary. But um, it's this, the neurons mean a lot to us uh, with everything. And the frontal lobe modularity. And if you want to know if your frontal lobes are working better, and I'm challenging the branch kids because we need younger people, is what we're really trying to recruit. We have 30,000 people now. Imaging, we can look at it. And you can see, am I me but better? We'd love for you to be part of it and see as a citizen scientist. And let's change the world. Thank you, Representative, for all that you do for us. Each of you, we have a responsibility to make our world better. Be part of it. Come on, let's go.